So I was uh, contemplating whether or not I should start a new sermon series that the Lord had put on my heart. But um, since um, next weekend, I'm actually going to have somebody else, a guest speaker, preach. And I'm excited about that. But this week is then like a buffer, a Sunday. And there was one message that I kind of felt like the Lord has put on my heart already for a while. Thank you so much. That the Lord has put on my heart for a while. And it's really something that I, I feel like is, is, is relevant. Um, it's a standalone sermon today, so it's going to be just this one Sunday. It's not the start of a series. But there is one subject that I have found myself that the Lord has taught me and that I have been teaching other people as opportunity came up or as uh, the subject arose somehow. I was talking about anointing. I was talking about anointing. I don't know. Have you ever heard about the term anointing? I mean, we, we use it readily uh, in our church language. And I forgot the offering, didn't I? Yep. All right. <laughs> I, I love you guys. You, you, they're like lifting up checks. Ushers, come on forward. Let's not forget to get our financial seeds into the ground. Should we do that? Hallelujah. Father, we bless the offering right now. We bless every cheerful giver, Lord. Receive our tithes and our offerings, Lord, for a plentiful harvest. Save lives, change lives, and use them for your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Man, go ahead. Yes, let's go into the kingdom. But uh, anointing is a subject um, that I have, I have myself actually wrestled with for a long, long time. And I want to tell you why. You know, I started my preaching career basically back in Europe, in Austria already. And there was a, a, a certain feel to when you feel like the Holy Spirit is taking over and you feel like the Holy Spirit is ministering through you and it's no longer you, but it's the Holy Spirit who, did you ever talk with a colleague or with a friend and all of a sudden you're like, wow, they, that came out with, with warmth and with zeal and with passion. And it was not just my intellect that was saying it, but it was the Holy Spirit that came across. Do you ever have those moments? See, that is something that we call anointing. And um, there is a lot of, uh, I, don't, I want to say misconcepts out there about like anointing. There is, oh gosh, there is, <laughs> there is a lot of false teaching out there about anointing as well, like grave soaking or something, where you just throw yourself over, or, or, or put yourself on the grave of a diseased person, and for some reason you, you soak up the anointing of that deceived minister. You know, there, there is misconcepts out there, but what is the anointing? Uh, if you're new to Riverside, maybe you will hear that that term um, maybe once, maybe twice, maybe uh, uh, many times, but I just want to talk for one Sunday about not only anointing, but uh, like what the anointing, uh, what the concept of anointing is, and it is important because I feel like we're, we're stepping into a new time and a new season where God ministers through us, amen? Well, very soon we're going to take our worship outside, and we want the Holy Spirit to minister through us to the other people around us. So the concept of anointing is very important. But there's also a second concept um, that is wearing the mantle. Wearing the mantle, like a cloak, you know, mantle. It's, it's not metal, somebody else. I, I mentioned it, and it's like, oh, do you mean metal or mantle? My, my Austrian accent, you know. <laughs> so I mean the mantle, like wearing a mantle that you can put on. So there is a concept out there, for example, where, and I've heard different people say, it, oh, um, I have received the mantle of anointing. But there is no such thing as this. There is no mantle of anointing. There is anointing and there is a mantle of leadership. And it's good to have both, right? But you can have the anointing without the mantle. And you can have the mantle without the anointing. And that is something really, really crucial. And um, maybe this, this, when you sit here and, and, and you listen to the sermon today, 
and you feel like the Lord has taken you in a couple steps of ministering to other people, he has put you in leadership, or he, he has given you responsibilities, and he wants you to take a step of faith and to step out into something that is like the Lord is putting a mantle on you, but the Lord also wants to put anointing on you so that the Holy Spirit can minister through you. So I believe those concepts really are important. I, and I want to take today as an educational day about the concept of anointing and mantle, especially you young ones uh, when it comes to the concept of uh, wearing the mantle and when it comes to anointing it is important I wish when I was younger somebody would have taught me that but it really was only like a couple of years ago where the Lord just showed me how everything came together and was like wow and so after that I, I started talking with people about it and all the people also were like wow this is good and this this is sound teaching so I, I wanted to soak this up if this is for you today uh, write it down. If you feel like this is over your head this morning, remember the date <laughs> when I preached this sermon. And uh, when the time comes in your life, go ahead, go back and look it up again, okay? Because there is something there that I believe is, is for us and that is really important. So I want to talk about uh, anointing and mantles. And just ahead of time, I just want to tell you one thing. Anointing is something where we feel like the Holy Spirit, it's almost like a measure. It's, um, I don't know, and I don't want to associate it with myself, like when, when I preach here, but did you ever listen to a speaker, or did you ever listen to, um, it could be on YouTube or a pastor, or somebody who speaks and you just feel like, man, the Holy Spirit is just impacting your heart. He's just speaking to you, and it's just, you, you can feel the Spirit coming across. Ever, ever had that? Right. And so, and it's like there's something that's coming across, but I want to tell you one thing. It does not rest with the person. Remember the, 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 uh, the parable that I used there with, with Samson? The power is, it was like it was with the hair, but it was in the Holy Spirit. The power always comes from God. It is only human means, and so there, there was like hair associated with it. But the power always rests with God. Anointing always comes from God. It basically means how easy of a conduit we are. And we can be a vessel and a conduit through whom the Holy Spirit can flow very easily or we're just like so full of ourselves that we give out of our own flesh and it comes with such a, a, a fragrance of ourselves. It comes with so much of, of me that I minister that it comes really more with my personality uh, than the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is just trying to get a little bit of that personality out of the way so that he can flow freely through us so that we can literally get a little bit out of his way. You know, I think the best vessel... When it comes, we, we sometimes compare ourselves with the vessels of God. Um, you know, and, and Paul even said in a great house that not only vessels of gold and silver, but also uh, wood and clay, you know, some of honorable use, some of dishonorable use. But if anyone cleanses himself, he will become a vessel of honorable use. So there's different vessels, right? We have the language of vessels. But, you know, the best vessel where the anointing can flow is, I want to associate it almost like a sieve. <laughs> You know, a sieve doesn't hold any water, right? A sieve. sieve. Right. <laughs> Thank you for the correction. A, a sieve. <laughs> you know, it doesn't hold any water. Did you ever try to, as a sieve to hold it under the faucet and to contain some water with it? It doesn't work because it runs right through it. Just imagine that that is the perfect symbolism for how we are, ought to be as human beings so that the whole maximum of the Holy Spirit flowing through us and maybe in the process, maybe washing us even cleaner, right? But that, that is the anointing. When the Holy Spirit comes through what we do or what we say almost in a completely unhindered way. There has been ministers, we call them the generals of God, ministers of, of the word. Gosh, just yesterday I was reading something from Smith Wigglesworth, I call him a Smithy. He's, he, a Smithy, he's, he was cool. But one of the things that Smithy was saying was like, if you want to step close into a relationship with God, it's very simple. It's like, it's like a four-step plan. You read the Word of God. So first of all, you take time with the Word of God. And then you let the Word of... No, you can, after you start reading the Word of God, I love it that he makes this distinction. You read the Word of God, which basically means you take time with the Word of God. But then he says, and then you start consuming the Word of God. 
It's like there's a different level of reading, right? Did you ever just skip read something? Oh, gosh, I, I skip read a lot of things in my life already. Uh, whenever a newspaper article or uh, things that don't really interest me, I just kind of like skim, skip read over it so that I kind of know what it's talking about, but I don't really read every word for word. I hope we don't do that with the Word of God. Because there is something about reading the Word of God that we need to consume. We need to feed ourselves. When my brother gave his heart to the Lord, he devoured, I always say, the, the Word. And he grew. It's like he, that was his nourishment. The food came out of it. That's what Mr. Smith meant. It's like devour the Word of and, and he says, consume the Word of God until it consumes you. Ooh. <laughs> That's good. We ought to read the Word of God. And then we ought to consume the Word of God until it starts consuming us. There is, a, there is a, a place and there is a time when we start reading the Word of God where all of a sudden we're not just read the Word of God, but we feel like the Word of God is reading us, <laughs> right? It's reading our thoughts. It's reading our intentions. It's reading everything about us. It's like, and it starts consuming us. We were like, man, this is good. This is good. I want to live by this. I, I want to use this as my pillow. And I, 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 you know, I want to dwell in the word of God. And then he says, and then go out. And no, then he says, then believe what it says and then act on it. It's like a five-step plan. For, <laughs> but everything in this five-step plan has something to do with the word of God, right? Read the word of God. Consume it until it consumes you. Believe in the word of God and then act of the word of God. It's like everything comes out of the word of God. He's, he was such a, a general of the Lord, you know, and when he was ministering, he did not have regards for, for men where people were thinking. <laughs> Once in the church service, he even walked straight in the back. And there, was a, there, there were, were people sitting and, and they, they were trying to boycott the church service and they came in and they were like sorcerers and witches and stuff. And so and the spirit told him right on the platform, he, he, he stopped. <laughs> and he went right there, and it was just sitting in pews, right? And he went to the pew and lifted the pew up, and they were all tumbling out. And right there, there was a door, and they all went out the door. I'm like, wow, this guy. I mean, you will never see me do this, right? But <laughs> I, I want to inspire you this morning. Just think for a moment. There is a man of God who had no regard for what people thought about him or criticized him or anything, but he just wanted to be a vessel and a container for that Holy Spirit and allow that Holy Spirit to flow through him as much as he can. That we have those, those people that we, gosh, and I, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm getting inspired by those people. I'm like, I want to be a man of one book. I want to be the man of one book that starts believing and acting on everything that this one book tells me. And not, not a plethora of, I mean, if you go in my, my office, I have a lot of books. But none of those books, I mean, they're all good for thought, but none of them is life-giving. There's only one book that is life-giving. There's only one book that creates faith, that has the ability to consume me, right? And that's, that's the word of God. And there's, there's this thing about anointing where I feel like, you know, God has a plan for us. God wants us to step out into the things. He wants to uh, step out, dabble into the, the ways of God, the way, the mechanisms, Paul calls it the mystery uh, that God has revealed in, in, in time now. Like, we want to walk in the things that God has for us. And I believe that every single person sitting here has a call of God on their life. Amen. Amen. Um, Jerry, uh, you mentioned something before the service started. Can, can I ask you to share this really quick? Just had a word. Yeah, my friend. I believe the Lord would say to you this morning, when I created you, I put in each one of you a destiny of greatness. There is nothing that you have ever done or nothing that you will ever do that will remove that greatness within your body. Hallelujah. Press in, saith the Lord. Come boldly into my throne room Amen. and ask for the revelation of that greatness that I have put within you. Amen. Come boldly into my throne room, saith the Lord, and ask for the fulfillment of that greatness that I have placed within you. Amen. Seek the greatness I have placed within you, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, thank you so much for sharing. 
the Lord has a calling on our life. What most miserable life would we live if we live for the rest of our life without ever stepping into the plans that God has for our life? And very many times, I want to say 100% of the times, it comes with a sacrifice. And we sacrifice more of us to get more of him. But like the Apostle Paul says, not that I have already achieved it, but one thing I do, I forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. I want us all to strain forward to what lies ahead. And the things that entangles us, that holds us back, cast it off. Cast it off. It's not worth it for if, we, if it makes us slow down in the things of God and we come to a halt and then we, kinda, uh, we, we're, we find ourselves stuck in time. Did you ever feel like you're stuck in time? Every once in a while we feel like we're stuck in time. It's because not because God is not moving anymore, but it's because we have stopped moving with him. And it's something that we have to realize. We have to take a break and realize that God has a destiny. He has a call. He has a call of greatness on our life. And now every calling that we have represented in this room is different, right? There, there are not, not two people in this room that God will use in exactly the same way. It's going to be all different. But as the limbs, as the body of Christ all works together, it will edify, will build up the body of Christ, and it's going to win souls. And that, that's what God wants us to do. So and one of those mechanisms that is so crucial for us to learn that as we start walking in this is, the, is that, that concept of anointing. Because that concept is not a special power. It is not a, a, a special something on us that is with us that came from my Austrian accent or something. The anointing is us getting out of the Holy Spirit's way so that the Holy Spirit can minister through us. When we wake up in the morning and our minds and our thoughts are already so preoccupied about all that stuff and we rush to our workplaces and how much use are we then to the Holy Spirit? How sensitive are we to the leading of the Holy Spirit when we're already so preoccupied with all of that, right? So the Holy Spirit wants us to take time being the Word of God, being the presence of the Lord, and just know who the Lord is. Did you ever smell the aroma of Christ? The aroma of Christ? It's called the aroma of Christ, right? Did you ever smell the aroma of Christ? It's a sweet smell. <laughs> it's sweet. It's, it's pleasant. To, stay, to be in His presence and to live in His presence and to make the Lord part of your life, it's, it, it, it's so important. But then the Lord starts working through us. So that, that part is called the anointing. It's how easy, it's the measure, how easy the Holy Spirit can minister through us. And I just want to use here a couple of scriptures, and I marked my Bible up here already with a couple of scriptures, and I, I really want, want you to see a couple key elements within anointing and within wearing the mantle that, that I, I hope to stay with you forever. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, we have the whole story about um, Saul and David and how God picked David as the new king over Israel. And this is, an anointing is not just an Old Testament concept, but it goes into the New Testament as well, and I'm going to be talking about this. But here's the passage. This is all from 1 Samuel chapter 16. It says, um, David anointed king. And it says, and then the Lord said to Samuel, right? Samuel was the prophet in the land, right, uh, during this time. And the Lord will, um, uh, oh, sorry. And the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? Wow, how long will you grieve over this, the, the, that other king before David? Uh, since I have rejected him. Listen, God promotes and God demotes. I want, you, I want you to know that God promotes and God demotes. I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go and I will send you to Jesse, uh, the, Beth, uh, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. So he is supposed to grab the, the oil and go out and anoint one of them to be the next king. Remember, the calling is from God. It comes from God. The choosing comes from God. When we talk about anointing, we have to realize it is not something that is because we are so good, but it is something that comes with God's, with God's picking, with God's selection, with God's choice, with God's calling on our life. 
And so he goes out and uh, he, he meets them. And then some of the elders, they come out of the town in verse 5. And they said, um, how have you come? Have you come peaceably? Or oh, the prophet of God is coming to our town. That could mean judgment or they can mean blessing. So what, what, what is it here? And, and they say, and he said, peaceably. I've come to uh, sacrifice to the Lord. But then he says something. Consecrate yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his son and invited them to the sacrifice. Before we can receive that anointing of God where, the, where that spirit flows through us, it never goes without prior consecration of our life. And that means dedication. That means giving God everything of our life. That means setting ourselves literally apart for God. Not, you know, we're so entangled in every day's business, every day world. Um, just met a young guy on, on the street. Um, I talked with him a little bit, and, and he, he changed his career. He was actually a tree cutter, and I bought a chainsaw off of him and just started talking with him. And, and so he's, he's a young gentleman, and now he wants to uh, be a car salesman. And just talk, told me about all his plans about selling cars and he wants to be rich and everything and, and, and the more he talked about it that how much of a good and lucrative business it is I was like mm, do you know the Lord <laughs> you know I, I started off like this and he, he wasn't going to a church anywhere and I said well if you ever come to Hutchinson drop drop on by by Riverside Church but I, I just think, you know, we can be so preoccupied with career and everything, but everything is just our own doing and is our own dreams. And, but it comes to a point where we have to constantly, if we want more of God, it does not come except there is less of us that God can replace with his stuff in our life. Less stuff from us and more stuff from God. And that only comes by consecrating, like stepping out of that stream of business and career. I, I'm not saying quit your jobs, don't get me wrong. But like <laughs> stepping out of that desire to uh, achieve more and claim more and do more and, and gain more and have more hobbies. You know, just that is per pursuit somehow. We're, we're supposed to pursue God, amen? And step out of that, consecrate ourselves like, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? It doesn't mean that we have to quit our jobs. It doesn't mean that we have to quit our, our, our hobbies. We, it, it, it's okay. But our first and foremost, do we first and foremost seek the kingdom of God? And that's, that's the question that it comes down to. And so anointing never comes without prior consecration. But then he comes out and in verse 6, it says, and then he came and he looked at Eliab. Um, Eliab was the, older, the oldest son of, of Jesse, and he said, oh, surely he's the anointed one. The anointed one is before him. But then the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his statue, because I have rejected him. Basically, I have not selected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. The Lord always does. The Lord always does look at the heart. You know, and it's, it's that heart that brings calling, and that, that, that's heart, that's that heart that brings where the Lord's like, he needs more time. And we feel that, like if the Lord gives us more time, but if the Lord, he sees our heart, everything always comes down with God, it comes down to a heart issue. If a heart is in the right place, or if heart is not in the right place. And so he anoints him with oil. I want you... Um, so then, then, then David uh, come like, okay, none of this is the, the so they're all parading in front of Samuel. He says, well, none of them. Do you have anyone else? I'm like, yeah, the younger still remains with, with the sheep. Uh, he's keeping the sheep in verse 11. And I'm like, well, go ahead and, and, and call him. We have time, right? God always takes his time, but he wants to get the right person. He wants to get the, the right stuff. And then as soon as he sees him, and he says, and now he was, and this is verse 12, now he was ruddy and, uh, and had beautiful eyes <laughs> and he was handsome. And the Lord said, arise and anoint him for he, for this is he. I want you to know that when God anointed David that, that day to become the next king of Israel, he was 15 years old. Do you remember when David became king of Israel? when he was 30 years old. God's anointing 
And God's selection, God's calling on our life picks very early. And the youth knows about that. I, 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 I preached a, a sermon series on the calling. But there is something that God does very early in our life that the Lord wants to give us already a foreshadow of what's coming. It kind of keeps our eyes on him. It kind of keeps our attention on him, and we start walking toward it. But then when the fulfillment comes, we also know it is not just by happens chance. It is by design. It is by God's design that God has, he has called us, and we have walked into it. It took 15 years for little David here to finally be in that role that, that God had anointed him, that God had called him for. So the anointing happens early in our life, and sometimes there's a waiting period, but then there's also something about uh, how that anointing looks like. Uh, remember Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61, there is something about the anointing too that, that, is, that is key. I want you to know it. Isaiah chapter 61, I'm just start reading. The, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. It's like this is the destiny, right? To, to do something, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, freedom to, to, to the captives, and an opening of the prison to those that are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of the Lord to comfort all who mourn. Do you realize that there is a me language here? There is a me language here when it comes to God's selection. The Lord, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me for a purpose. There is a me language God has anointed for a purpose. But then it starts shifting. Then it, 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 the, the focus becomes they and those. Uh, uh, check this out in verse 3. To grant to those, the other people who mourn in Zion, and to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness and planted of the Lord, and uh, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall rise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. Hallelujah. When the anointing of God, there is a selection and we can feel that the Lord is stirring something inside of us and that the Lord has a purpose with it, right? The Lord has a purpose when the Lord does something inside of us, when we can feel that tingle of the Holy Spirit and the leading of the Holy Spirit and he wants to break out, he wants to do something, there is always a purpose. He doesn't just do that to make us feel good, but he does that because there is those there is those that he wants to impact. There is they that he wants to save. Those that he wants to lead out of dungeons. The blind eyes that he wants to open up, right? It's not just for us, but when the Lord, we can go happy, happily through all our life and we never see miracles and healings and what the Lord can do in other people's lives if we, if we feel like that all we want is the Holy Spirit to come upon our life just to make us feel good. If we want to see everything that God has for our life, it is always related to those today. And you know, it, it, is a, it, is, it is eyes for the lost. We need to have a eyes and a mindset for the lost. We need to see the lost. We need to ask the Lord to give us, to, to, to fan our hearts into flame for the lost, to help us to see them the way that the Lord sees them. And once we see they, once we see the hunger, once we see what God wants them to have, that the Lord wants to save them, that the Lord wants to turn their lives around, once we see that, how the Lord sees and how the Lord feels about them, it will stir our spirit. And once we're like, Lord, do something. Send me. Pick me. Don't, don't look any further. Pick me. Just send me. And then the Lord starts pouring out more and more because then we become a conduit for they and for those. Do you, do you realize that? Anointing is never self-serving. Anointing is always serving other people. And it's always serving them in the works that God wants to do with they and with those. Um, we see the whole concept of anointing in the New Testament as well. Um, and this is in 1 John, for example. And it talks about, you know, <laughs> when the Holy Spirit is on us, 
Some people ask, like, a pastor, what, what, what's a good source? What, what, what's a good book? Or what, uh, what, what teaching can I follow in this? And what, like, man, this, we, we've got the teaching. We've got the book already. We've got the Holy Spirit already who teaches us in all things. And he's the one who teaches us the, the truth. So the, the concept of the anointing is in the New Testament as well. He's in First John chapter 2. And in verse 20, it says, But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. Really? There's a lot of things that I don't know, but I believe that this is true. I believe that this is true, and I believe that the Holy Spirit can help us figure all things out. I believe that when it says, But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. You have we all have the knowledge. And then in verse 26, it says, I write these things to you so that no, uh, no one uh, might be trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you have received from him abides in you. And you have no need for anyone else to teach you. But as the anointing teaches you about everything. Like, wow, really? Like the Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Holy Spirit guides us in all truth, right? He convicts the world of its sin. He shows us our stuff. The Holy Spirit is showing them their stuff. And as we do that, as we walk in the Holy Spirit, listen, there is not one problem that the Lord ever solved in my life that he has not first shown me and revealed to me in prayer. He always does. It's like if there is a problem, if I don't know which way to pick or something, as soon as I pray, and sometimes I don't hear it right away, but as soon as I, and sometimes it goes away on its own, and sometimes it just takes a little bit longer. But when we spend time with God, the, the path becomes clear. And the, the God starts directing us in the right direction. The anointing of God is on us, and it leads us in all truth, and it's guiding us, and it's teaching us. But it comes from the source, and that source is the Holy Spirit. Now, there is one very important aspect of anointing that the Lord showed me a long time ago now, was there is no anointing without crushing. Man, I want you to write this one down. If that's the only thing you remember, then I, we, we are supposed to walk in the anointing of God. Amen. But remember one thing, the anointing never comes without the crushing. Where, where does grape juice come from? Yeah. The crushing, yeah. the wine press. That's where the crushing happens, a sieve, uh, feet. What, what do we say? Sieve, the sieve. <laughs> a machine fabricated this thing. I have no idea how it was made, but it has a lot of holes in it. I want to say maybe it just pushed all the things out, right? It never comes without the crushing. The Apostle Paul uh, talks about that. Uh, uh, for, let, let me back up a little bit. Even in, in Isaiah chapter 53, uh, Isaiah chapter 53, we have the Messianic servant song about the suffering servant. This is, this is a picture about Jesus Christ, right? But it says here in verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgression and he was crushed for our iniquities. There is no anointing without crushing. And if we want to experience the anointing of God in a life where the Holy Spirit can flow through us, it takes a lot of crushing of our personality, a lot of crushing of our mind, a lot of crushing of our intentions, of our desires, and what we want to accomplish, and a lot of crushing is going on. Is that pleasant? No, but it sure is good when the Holy Spirit starts flowing later. But this is, this is the part where we have to die to ourselves, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, right? We got to die. Sometimes we just don't want to die to ourselves, but we got to die. There is nothing, the, the, the flesh availeth not much, right? We have to die to our flesh. There, it, it comes with the crushing. In Isaiah uh, 42, just a little bit earlier, this is, this is how the, the Lord ministers, right? There's another um, a messianic uh, a, a prophecy. We call it another servant song. Uh, this is where it says, The Lord's chosen servant, behold my servant, whom I will uphold, my chosen, and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, right? That, that anointing flows through him. And I will, he will bring forth justice to the nations, and he will not cry aloud he, or lift up his voice or make uh, make it heard in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faint burning wick he will not quench. 
He will faithfully bring forth justice and he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice on earth and the coastlands wait for his law. There is something about that anointing that is not aggressive. There is something about this anointing that comes with humbleness and with meekness and with sweetness. Just imagine that the Lord, he never shouted on, on the streets. He waited until the people came to him to receive teaching from him. There is something about that anointing that is always sweet. It's never, if we ever feel like that we have the anointing of God and we can go to our neighbors and we can go uh, maybe to school or we can go and so on and we gotta tell them what is right, right? And we gotta tell them when they're wrong. That's not the anointing of God, but the anointing of God, it is always sweet, it is always humble. It always has this, this sweet and pleasant flavor where, where people are being drawn to. It's the Holy Spirit that works it, and, and people are being drawn to, right? Uh, Philippians chapter two, Apostle Paul starts talking about uh, his ministry. I don't think you have that on the slide. Don't worry about it. Uh, Philippians chapter two. Th this is this is what the Apostle Paul, one of the 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 the, the, the biblical authors where we have most of our literature from. He says, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice sacrificial offering of your faith. The Apostle Paul saw himself and his ministry as a drink offering that is being poured out for, for other people. That's how he regarded his life. And in, 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 in 2 Timothy, there's a passage where he, where he teaches Timothy of, of, of how to minister. He says in verse six, uh, chapter four, verse six, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. He is in, in jail, he is in prison, he is waiting for execution, literally. And he is maybe hoping for a miracle, but he says, I am more already, I am already in the process of being poured out as a, as a drink offering. It's always for other people. The Lord is using our life for other people. And the Apostle Paul, he's, he says in another passage, this is how everybody should regard us as under roars of Christ, as servants of Christ Jesus. When it comes to anointing on our life, when we wanna be vessels of God and so that God can flow through us, there is something about us and our intentions and our will, what we are upset about, what we're happy about, to get all of this to get out of the way and then allow the Holy Spirit to minister through us. And once he starts doing that, it is always sweet. It is always humble. It always loves. It always loves other people. And then people are starting to get drawn to it. In 2 Corinthians 4, um, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, this is, this is what the Apostle Paul says. He talks about this treasure that we have in jars of clay. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed, uh, per, uh, crushed, perplexed, but we are not driven a spear, persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. So we are pressed in from all sides, but we're never coming to an end. That, that whole process is that crushing. We live, our life lives in that crushing. Verse 10, there's always carrying in our body the death of Jesus my my wife <laughs> it happens it happens don't worry about it okay back verse 10 it says always carrying in the body the death of jesus we carry in our bodies the death of jesus christ right so that the life of jesus may also be manifest in our bodies like we are being a display did you ever write on the blackboard or whiteboard or smartboard, whatever board we have nowadays? You know, did you ever write on this? Like, it becomes a public thing where you, where you, where you, where you can teach other people. Last Sunday, I used here a, a whiteboard to, to write down a couple of teachings, right? We, our life is a whiteboard for other people. And we carry on our life the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the Lord. And that is where the power of God starts flowing. Yeah. Carrying in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. For we who live are always being given over to death. <laughs> really? I thought being a Christian means that everything is gonna go up from now, right? Wow, this is depressing. Verse 11, for 
for we who live, we are always being given over to death. We, 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 it's not our life. We're laying down our life. We're picking up our cross and we follow Jesus Christ, right? We are, we are dying to ourselves in order to trade it in for the eternal life and that calling that God has on our life. Given over to death for, uh, for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. The more we die to ourselves, the more people see the life of Christ in us. Ooh. The more we die to ourselves, you know, people ask me every once in a while, how can I get more into a relationship with God? Like, it's bad news. You gotta die to yourself. You gotta die to yourself. But, but how? I'm like, I don't know. It's, it's your life that's between you and the Holy Spirit. But I'm, I bet the Holy Spirit has been knocking on many doors already or put his thing or finger or thumb or gentle reminders on many things in our lives. And only if we take those steps, then, the, and then we, start, we start obeying. And once we start walking in that obedience, the Holy Spirit starts manifesting and the life of Jesus Christ becomes manifest in us. So the death, so... Death is at work in us, but life in you, and life that flows. Man, there is something about this whole concept of anointing. And then people always admire anointing. We always admire when we, when we hear our preachers, when I look at the big generals of faith, like Smithy and Catherine Kuhlman and Benny Hinn, um, just, just people that walked and had amazing God experiences. They had amazing God experiences, and we can admire that. But Catherine Kuhlman said, there is nothing that God did in her that you cannot experience as well. It's only a matter of obedience and yielding. Like, wow. The only reason why we don't see it in our personal life is because we haven't yielded. We haven't consecrated. We haven't given. We haven't died to our life in order to have the Lord consume everything inside of us and start flowing through us. And that's a really important concept. The other uh, concept is wearing the mantle. The mantle, I want you to know one thing. Anointing comes from God. Mantle comes also from God, but through the hands of man. Because when we talk about mantles, it, it talks about leadership. And it talks about, you know, we, but we all are growing up in the world where there's already a lot of leadership around us, Right? And we are growing up in that context, in society, in, in the fabric of, of the world in which we live already. And there is certain times, there is timings when God allows us to lead in certain areas. When God allows us, when all of a sudden he makes it happen that lead, uh, Saul and David, when the leadership falls to us. Like uh, uh, David waited for 15 years for that opportunity. Let's go back to that example. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, I want you to know one thing too about uh, Saul. Um, and this is how, you know, Saul, there was something that was going wrong in Saul. He did not have that heart of David, that, 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 that personality. There was too much of him there. Uh, and where, where he's like, well, just honor me in front of people. But I have obeyed. You know, he came up with excuses. And when, and when the prophet confronted him about something, he did not wait for the prophet. And he kind of put it up as a statue of himself, kind of glorifying himself. So he, he, he kind of messed up there in a couple of areas. But then it was... When, when the prophet called him out, how he reacted in that moment that really came to the point of being rejected as king over Israel. And then in verse 22, it says, And Samuel said, Has the Lord, has the Lord, as, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Man, we can sacrifice to God whatever we want. <laughs> In the end of the day, what really, really counts is have we obeyed him in the things that he has asked of us? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen is, uh, is better than the fat of ram. For, uh, rams. Uh, for rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption as iniquity of, and, and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Like, ooh, those words. Uh, 3,000 years ago, those words when they were spoken, God, God took the leadership from Saul. Remember, how many years later did David become king? 
Because right 15 years, because right after that, he anointed David, right? It was right at that, at that point in history. So God removed that, that leadership. God removed the anointing, that spirit of God flowing through and God's destiny just coming through. So he withheld all of that because he was a vessel that was just closed up. He didn't want to die to himself. There was so much of him. He put up a statue. He came up with his own rule. He did not obey God. And because there was so much of him, God removed that anointing from him. And then he sent out uh, Samuel to anoint David, who was only 15 years old. But even though God removed the anointing from him, he was still king for 15 years. Remember that? He was king for 15 years. He still wore the royal mantle. He still was in charge of Israel for another 15 years. And that was not good, good 15 years, right? But he was still in charge. He was still wearing the mantle. So you can have the anointing like David had the anointing, but he didn't wear, he wasn't king. He didn't wear the mantle of leadership. And Sam and Saul, he, he had no anointing anymore, but he had the leadership of Israel. And that's when stuff starts getting messy. In that situation, David waiting for 15 years, it's a walk of faith. It's a walk of training. It's a walk of getting closer to God, of getting to know the voice of the shepherd, of knowing what God wants in his life. It's like we can have the anointing of God even early in life. We can have that anointing, and in due time, God will work it out that we will also receive the mantle of leadership. When God makes us step out in the plan that God has for us, that time will be coming, but even walking up to that time, it's, we, we can have that anointing without the mantle, but we're growing into that and then when the time comes that God has set for us, the mantle will fall to us too. But on the other hand, you can have the mantle, you can wear the leadership, you can lead, and there is no anointing anymore. That I've heard from somebody who said, uh, the average of the pastors that stay ministering in churches is four years after they know that they should have resigned. I was like, really? When I heard that a couple of years ago, when I heard that for the first time, I was like, what's wrong? You know, somebody else, Benny Hinn used to, to teach on that. There's one teaching that I, one day I wanted to show my staff to. And, um, there was a teaching where Benny Hinn said, Some, sometimes we walk so much in, 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 in business of time and everything that we, we work and we move and we move and we move. And at some point we were collaborating with the Lord and the Lord was using us and working through us. But somehow we became so self-confident that all, and we started ignoring the Lord and we didn't, we, we didn't even realize anymore that the Lord was gone. The Lord has already left. And we just keep on working in the same way and in the same fashion, but we kind of realize that, and then we get angry because things don't start wor working out the way that we want, and we just keep on doing and keep on doing, but we do all of this in our own strength. It is a dire place like that. You know, and we, we can in our life and in our ministry and wherever God has called you at the workplace, when the Lord has a plan for you if, you, if you don't take the time to stay in the Lord, to stay in that flow of the Holy Spirit through you, but you, you start working on your own, you kind of, you know, we're called to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Remember that? I think I talked last Sunday about it. In step with Him. Sometimes we just run ahead. And sometimes the Holy Spirit takes then, wanted to take this turn because he wants us to walk in this direction. And because we are so insensitive, we don't even hear his voice anymore. We just keep on walking in our intentions, in our desires, in a different direction. And that's when in, this, in the life of, of Saul, why he came, why he came to to an halt, basically. He, we, we see then how David entered into the service of Saul and how uh, uh, Saul got angry sometimes. He threw his javelin, he threw his spear. He wanted to pin him against the wall, right? Anger comes in. When things don't work out, we get angry. Where the anointing of the Lord is, there is peace. There is sweetness. Anger doesn't set in. Even when David was persecuted, he didn't wear the mantle yet, but even when David was persecuted, he was hiding in a cave for dear life, right? And everybody said, oh, Saul is there. You can't just pin him to the ground right there. You can have your retribution and just have all that. And he stayed sweet. He's like, no, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. I'm not, I'm this, the, he wears the mantle still. He is the one that God has still in charge. If God wants me in charge, God will do it his way, but I'm not going to lay hands on 
holiness and help myself to it. And so, it, like, he stayed sweet. He had the anointing. He did not have the mental. He could have made a shortcut here, right? He could have made a shortcut here. He could have been king of Israel, right, when in that cave, in that moment. But he said no. And so he was running for a couple more years, right? God works all things out. We have that story of in, in Elisha, in Elijah and Elisha as well. I'm not going to read the story right now. I'm just going to recap. Remember, yeah, no, there's something really good in that story. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> in the first Kings uh, chapter 19, we have the call of Elisha. And this was uh, after that, that, that whole scenario where Elijah was on a mountain. You know, he, he killed the Baal prophets and then he was running for dear life because of evil Jezebel. And so he was coming to the mountain and God was like, what are you doing here? I, I didn't call you. What are you doing here? Go back. And so God is giving him instructions like go anoint so-and-so to be king. And so he gives him instructions on the road. And, then, and, and he tells him already who is going to be um, the next prophet after him. And he says, it's going to be Elisha. And so go and anoint him. He hasn't anointed him at that point. Instead, he goes and he, recruit, he recruits him. He takes his, his mantle, basically his cloak, it says here in verse 19, and he lays it on him, kind of, kind of like as this recruitment, uh, um, act of recruitment. So he, and, and then he goes and like he, he was just plowing with 12 oxes and the hu huge thing. Cannot imagine how that would have looked like. But he, he burned all the bridges. He did not look back. Anybody who puts his uh, hand on the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Elisha was one of these guys like, man, I just burned everything. I give it to the poor. I give it to everything. He burned the bridges and was like, Lord, I'm yours. I follow you. There's no going back. I'm, I'm all in. I'm all the way in. And then, so Elisha had that. And then, and then when, when the Lord uh, removed Elijah and when God removed Elijah, and this is in 2 Kings, just a couple pages uh, further. Um, in 2 Kings chapter 2, um, God takes Elijah, he, he calls him out. He literally raptures him, right, with, with a fiery chariot. God, I want to be picked out one day like that, with a fiery chariot just coming and swooping me up, right? Um, but it, it says here, this is what God wanted to do with Elijah. Elijah. And so Elisha was sticking close with his side at his side and Elijah kept telling him stay here stay here I'm like nope nope I'm coming with you where you go I will go too but then Elijah listen to what Elijah is telling him he says in verse 3 um, do you not know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you remember the words over you okay and then in verse uh, 5 and then the sons of the prophets of uh, Jericho, Jeremiah, Elisha said, Elisha said to him, do you not know that today the Lord will take your master from over you? There is sometimes leadership is given to other people, but there is a time when that, when that mantle of leadership will, will come toward you. And the Lord knows that timing when there is, first you had somebody over you, but then you rise. Maybe, maybe God gives you promotion at your job. You know, and only the Lord knows that timing. And maybe you, you, I've heard from many people, I've been overstepped with promotions and stuff. And, you know, I work all, so and so many years and so hard in my life. And I kind of feel like I'm always getting overstepped with the promotions in my life. I've been in a place like this before back in Europe. And it's, it's this place where we just have to be patient and wait for God. Amen. And then... And then as God comes and he picks up, he swoops up Elijah and he is going out and his cloak falls to the ground. Now, but listen careful, Elisha did not just pick up his cloak and put it on. I was like, ah, oh, cool, it's me now. Finally, I get it. Listen to what he did. And this is in, in verse 12. Um, it says, and then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He tore his own stuff and then he picked up that mantle. Sometimes we, I always say mantles are not transferable from, from one kingdom into another. Sometimes we have to get rid of our own stuff, of what we think that we know, of the stuff that we think that we can accomplish, our own wills, our own intention, everything that we have been maybe trained in and the way of doing things. And we have just, we have to tear this like, Lord, I lay all of this aside 
And right now, I receive this mantle, this new stuff that you have me walk in. Maybe it's at the job site. Maybe it's with a friendship. Maybe it's in the neighborhood, where, wherever it is. But that new, I receive the new unhindered from all the filters of my previous life and my life experience and everything that you have done. One of the greatest things that God has ever blessed me with personally is forgetfulness. <laughs> I love it because I don't cling to old stuff. I don't cling to old knowledge. I, I live in the now. And what God does in the now, I just step right in, in the now, what God has. If I would be bogged down by everything that I always hear or read or see or something, man, I, I would have a hindrance of walking the new stuff. And I feel like, just like the Apostle Paul, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. And that is all the, the, the pain of the past. And maybe it's even good experience that served as model of the past. But listen, it was a model of the past. It's not a model of the new. God wants us to focus in the new, on the new, on him, because in the new day, God brings forth the new stuff, and we have to walk in that, and it keeps constantly changing. And if we work out of the models of our old experiences, we will miss what God is trying to do in the now. So I just want to conclude with this. Remember Joseph for a moment. Joseph had two mantles. Remember that? First, he had the colorful mantle, that, that his, his father gave him, and he wore it with pride. Remember that? He wore it with pride. And everybody else was jealous at him, and so they tried to get rid of him. And then God took him through this crushing experience. Remember that? For years, he felt like he's never going to come out of this prison anymore. God took him through this crushing experience. And then one day later, he wore a mantle again, and it was a royal mantle. If God does not take us through the crushing, we will always wear mantles, the things that God is giving in our life, the, the things that God wants us to step into, into our future. If God doesn't take us through the crushing, we will wear those things with pride and with self-righteousness. And there's only one cure for that, that God can ensure that we will wear this, this man, mantle, that ministry, that task that God is giving in our life with humbleness and sweetness, and that's that crushing experience. And God, God takes us through, and sometimes he does it, he does it different with all of us. Some maybe have a, a burn house or a flat tire. You got laid off of a job or uh, maybe a marriage that kind of fell apart and something happened, but, you know, it's like it rattles everything up. This last year was this year of rattling. Everything, all the foundations just got rattled. Everything that we thought that we knew was rattled. Uh, God allows crushing to happen in our life so that we can lo uh, learn to walk in, in tenacity and experience and keep our hopes on him. But then once we experience that, we start all of a sudden to realize that it's not about us. It's not about us. It's not about what we want to accomplish. It's all about the Lord. And all we have to do is to get ourselves behind us and be those conduits that the Lord can start flowing through us. Amen? Yeah. That, that is what I want to leave us with. So again, today is a standalone sermon, but it's a, I, I feel like the Lord is bringing us into a new season. Um.